Welcome to Prepare the Way, a show dedicated to all matters related to evangelization. I am your host, Martha Fernandez Sardina, Director of the Office for Evangelization of the Archdiocese of San Antonio and Director of Prepare the Way Enterprises, a ministry dedicated to helping Catholics become everyday evangelized evangelizers. A while back, a coworker of mine said to me, you have beautiful feet. No, he wasn't speaking about pedicures and how beautiful my toenails are. He was speaking about scripture and about, about evangelization. He was quoting St. Paul who quotes the Old Testament and saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. That's what you and I are called to. That's what the Lord expects of us. That's what the world needs. Today, we will listen to two interviews that I conducted at the New Evangelization of America conference in Dallas, Texas, some time ago. The first is with Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga. He is the Cardinal Archbishop of Tegucigalpa in Honduras. The second interview is with Mark Grogan. He's a convert from Judaism, and he shares with us how it is that we can and must bring the good news to our Jewish brothers and sisters. It's a pleasure to be with you, Your Eminence, Oscar Andres Rodriguez Maradiaga. Yes. I love yes. the name. <laughs> Thank you. It's also a big pleasure for me to be with you. Thank you. You are the Archbishop of Tegucigalpa in Honduras. Yes. yes. And you also have some, uh, I'm sure, some responsibilities directly with the Vatican. Is that correct? Of course. I am now the President of Caritas Internationalis, which is a federation of 162 Caritas in different nations of the world, as well as member of some dicasteries in the Vatican. That's great. What are your thoughts, uh, Cardinal, on the advances that we've made in the last 10, 20, 30 years with regards to the new evangelization? Well, we are very happy because we have new instruments in order to take the good news of the gospel to most of our people nowadays. You mentioned in a talk in which I heard you speak about how many billions of uh, people there are in the world, how many million are Christian, and you were appealing to all Catholics to become truly missionaries. Share with us a little bit about that. Yes, this is one of the goals of the past conference of bishops of Latin America in Aparecida in the year 2007. We were thinking that of the six 0.5 billion people in the world, only 1.2 billion are Christians and know Christ. So it's a, it's a big effort to try to take the good news of Christ to the rest of the world. And this needs a missionary heart like St. Paul did. Now, many people, when they hear missionary, they think, oh, I need to leave my homeland and go to China, Africa, wherever. And yet you just mentioned that we have new technologies to be missionaries. How do those two go together? Well, you know that in the past, to go to a different continent took months in a, in a ship, maybe. Now, it's a matter of hours. You can leave the United States, and next day you are in Europe, you are in Asia, you are in whatever, whoever place you would like to go. And this is marvelous, how technologies of communication, but not only communication in the airlines, but uh, what about the internet that takes seconds to be in the other parts of the world? This means that uh, we have new instruments of missionary work that have to be used. And this is, this is very good that the church is responding to the new challenges of these technologies. And it is a challenge because there's the good, the bad, and the ugly on the internet. Of course, I recall some years ago, I was in a big um, convocation of young people in El Paso, Texas, and there was a, a kid, a very smart one, who was asking me, tell me, please, what can we do with all the trash that we can find in internet? And I said, you have the answer in your finger. Mm -hmm. As you were asking, you know that with this finger, you can press delete, or you can press enter. So here is the answer, and try to delete what is trash and try to enter in what is good. Nowadays, for instance, we have a beautiful program, which is in English, in Spanish, and in Portuguese, called Leccionautas. It means those young men and women who read the scripture 
by the internet. Wow. There are special programs designed for the young with the liturgy of Sundays and the explanation of the texts of the Bible. So we have formed, and I said we because I, I am involved in that, with the great cooperation of American Bible societies to prepare 8,000 leaders in this kind of things. And we calculate nowadays 320,000 young men and women are doing the Lexio Divina through this program. There are beautiful examples such as uh, a group of uh, young poor boys that do not have internet, but they have the small phone. And with messages, they do the Lexio Divina on Sundays. And this is wonderful. Wow. So we can use as well the new technologies for spreading the good news. So we are fulfilling, in a way, that uh, call of Pope Paul VI in Evangelii Nunciandi, Evangelization of the Modern World, where he says that the uh, modern means of communications are the new pulpit. Yes. He even added that we would be guilty before the Lord if we do not use them well. Of course, and this is very important, and this is appealing to our responsibility, and this is the reason why we are together here, how to respond to that big appeal that the, the servant of God, John Paul II, did to the whole church. That's a great thing, and I, I liked, liked what you said about deleting and not entering. So even as we uh, invite our people to use the internet, for example, and other means of communication, we also need to be pastoring them, teaching them how to use them well? Yes, it's necessary as everything, because the human being can be educated, and when you educate your time, your free time, your leisure time, and uh, so you can, you can use better your own time. You know, sometimes people will shy away from big projects because it takes too much effort or it takes too much money. And um, I feel that sometimes the Lord is calling us anew to be challenged in faith, believing in the impossible. What are your thoughts on that? This is, for me, the most important thing in life. When you have faith, you can do whatever. That is why the Lord taught us, if you could have faith like a, a little seed of mustard, you could tell that mountain, move, and the mountain will obey. So it, it, he was trying to emphasize that we have to have faith, and with faith, you can do whatever. There are no impossible projects. Some people would say, I pray, I have faith, and I don't see anything happen. What are some good examples in, in recent history of faith, mountain-moving faith? Well, you know, the problem is that the calendar of our Lord does not coincide with our calendar, and we would like to have immediate results. And He, does, he knows which is better for us, and that is why His calendar is a little different. We have to have faith and then go on. The, the answer will come. Reminds me of that beautiful reading from uh, the book of Hebrews where it relates that story of Abraham and all our other fathers in the faith where they went in obedience and faith not knowing where they were going. Exactly. And this is what we need nowadays. We know that we are going for the best, that our Lord will not uh, betray us and uh, that we can achieve everything when we go together with him. What about other areas in which we need to continue to uh, develop our new evangelization at the parish level, at the diocesan level? Well, um, during a conference we recently had here in Dallas, it's, uh, I spoke about the pastoral conversion. Pastoral conversion is a new appeal. It means that all what we have been doing in the parishes seems to be a, an obsolete uh, model. And we need to, to look for new models of pastoral methods. And, and this is what we call the pastor, uh, conversion, pastoral conversion. Uh, for instance, there is a lot of Catholics who are far away from the church and we need to go and look for them and to invite them to come back home because church is their home. Many times they are far away for different reasons, but you're always welcome at your home. 
and these are new pastoral methods we do need. You, do you have some in mind that you could suggest to the people of God who are viewing you and listening to you now, things, ways in which they can get involved? With well, this? yes, starting by your own family, parents or brothers and sisters could think, what happened to my cousin, what happened to my aunt, to my uncle? I don't see them anymore in the church. I will try to guess what is going on. Sometimes we have this kind of, uh, of uh, you know, fear of entering in a private uh, life. And maybe they are expecting that. Somebody that could just help them and, and go back. So I think it's necessary to, to go back to the creativity of the gospel. That's terrific. In these closing seconds that we have, what kind of exhortation would you have for the people of God? Well, especially not to be afraid, to be courageous, and to ask St. Paul, to ask the Holy Spirit a heart like his. He, St. Paul, was intrepid, and he was always doing, woe of me if I don't preach the gospel. We need that. Amen. Thank you so very much, Your Eminence. All the best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The words of the Cardinal should encourage each one of us to take seriously this call to be saints and to be missionaries, disciples. We'll be right back after this break, so don't go away. Welcome back to Prepare the Way. We are about to hear an interview that I had with Mark Grogan, a convert from Judaism who shares with us how we are to reach out to the people of Israel. These are dear brothers and sisters of ours. We pray on Holy, on Good Friday, for example, in a special way for the chosen people that they too may come to know Jesus Christ as the expected Messiah. I hope you enjoy the insights that he offers to us so that you may reach out to anyone of the Jewish faith that you might know. Mark Drogan with Remnant of Israel. What is that? Remnant of Israel is a Jewish apostolate proclaiming the Jewish roots of the gospel and the Jewish roots of the church. That's terrific. So that to help Catholics understand that we actually have this rich heritage in Judaism? Yes, we reach out to anybody who's interested in, in the truth and the, and the gospel message. And primarily we speak to Catholics to try and help Catholics understand our own identity and the identity of the church and the, the apostolic identity of the church, that the church is one holy, Catholic, and apostolic, I think it's important today to help us understand more the apostolic part of that statement. Now, when you say apostolic, the first thing that comes to my mind and anyone's mind is we come from the apostles, that we are founded on the apostles, and yet where are the Jewish roots there? Because they're the Jewish? The apostles are Jewish. And uh, what we do now is I've started a first century Judaism seminar and the point of the seminar is to show that in the first century there was a, a vigorous debate among Jews within Judaism between after Pentecost it was between the apostles and the followers of Jesus and other Jews who did not accept Jesus as the Messiah but it was a de debate a dialogue within Judaism and the apostles never thought that they were starting a new religion. The apostles did not consider themselves converts. They were Jewish and they found the fullness of Judaism and all they did, all they wanted to do was proclaim that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel. Hmm. And so the debate would have been whether or not to continue with Judaic law or, or not? Well that's recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. The first council of Jerusalem was uh, the question of how much of the Jewish law, how much of the law of Moses would uh, followers of Jesus be required to follow, and specifically circumcision. And then a big question came up in the Acts of the Apostles when uh, Peter started eating with Gentiles, and could the uh, followers of Jesus, who were entirely Jewish, and still following the uh, Mosaic law, could they eat with Gentiles? And so that was uh, the subject of the First Council of Jerusalem recorded in the Acts of the Apostles. Gentiles being a non, people, men and women of non-Jewish. Non -Jewish. Gentile, and, and I grew up in a Jewish family, even though my, we were atheist, atheistic socialists, but we were definitely Jewish, and uh, my wife grew up in a Jewish family, and all Jews know that uh, a Gentile simply means non-Jewish. Correct, so even in those, so I would be a Gentile. 
anybody who's not and, Jewish. And you are Jewish. Right, but the by question blood. is by, by taking it to a first century Judaism seminar, we're trying to recover the mind of the apostles for Catholics today, for the church today in the third millennium, to re refresh the apostolic mentality and the apostles did not see themselves as Gentiles. After Pentecost, there was a shift, and at some point, you could followers of Jesus even started to say that those who did not follow Jesus were uh, the, the names shifted. The, those terms mm -hmm. shift over time. What was the value of the seminar? What, what do you hope to attain? What would it help a Gentile like myself, in other words, a non-Jewish Catholic Christian believer? How is the first century uh, Judaism seminar to help me in my faith? Well, it helps to grow in your faith in every aspect, but in the center of the faith, the source and center of our Catholic life is the Eucharist. And so the source and center of the seminar is the Eucharist, which is, uh, in fact, a, comes from a Mosaic sacrifice. It's in the law, law of Moses, in the Leviticus, in, in the Torah. And the apostles, after Pentecost, when they started celebrating what we now call Eucharist, uh, they, there was a, a period where they saw it as they were celebrating a mosaic sacrifice called the sacrifice of thanksgiving. The Hebrew word is todah, and they would celebrate the sacrifice of thanksgiving, which is the, the Levitical sacrifice, and then gradually they started using the Greek word, which is Eucharist. But not only in the Eucharist then, which is the source and center of our Catholic life, but everything in our Catholic life has these Jewish roots. And so the first century Judaism seminar helps us to grow deeper in our Catholic faith in, in, through the Eucharist, in the liturgy, through scripture, and through knowing Jesus and the apostles and why we say the church is apostolic and the identity of the church as the people of God, one continuous people of God, through history. Now, uh, the celebration of the Eucharist, would it have been, uh, in, in, in your estimation, also the celebration of the Passover? Do we understand yes, the connection? Yes, yes. And, and that's in Scripture. St. Paul says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. And we understand the Eucharist as a celebration of the Passover, but it becomes much more than that. When we go into the first century Judaism seminar, we do what Pope Benedict talks about in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, is that we go deeper into these mysteries. We see that uh, Jesus uh, told the truth when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. He said, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. We believe that, Catholics believe that he did not come to abolish the, the Torah, but to fulfill it. But we go deeper into it so that a lot of people see it as a contradiction. And, and that's Pope Benedict's dialogue with uh, Jews today in his book, Jesus of Nazareth is that Jews today say, well, Jesus didn't fulfill the Torah. But Pope Benedict says he, showed, he revealed a deeper meaning, and so we go mm -hmm. deeper into that, and so we see that it, the Eucharist is not only the Passover, but it's all of the Mosaic law, all of it. There's the uh, Day of Atonement. Mm -hmm. There's other sacrifices that are all brought to their fullness in the, the Catholic liturgy. Now, you, you mentioned the seminar, but for individuals who can't attend one of these seminars, which you offer in Dallas, is that correct? We offer them in Dallas and in other Catholic uh, universities around the country. Okay. There are a number of books that Remnant of Israel has put out. Well, we have right? books, but the material in the seminar right now is not in books, but we do have a website. It's firstcenturyjudaism.com. Okay, and people can and find there at that website information on the various yes, topics. Yes, there's some of the material from the seminars is on firstcenturyjudaism.com, and we spell out F-I-R-S-T, firstcenturyjudaism.com. We're gradually putting the material onto the website. It's a work in progress. It's a continuing seminar, and it's a seminar because it's a, an open discussion, and it's for really for mature Catholics who want to grow deeper in their faith and understand especially not only our Catholic faith and how we live it and, and through the Eucharist and through the sacraments, but deeper into scripture and deeper into the l identity of the church. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is really a dialogue to 
understand the apostolic, uh, the first century Judaism. Now, what some was of, going on in, and how the church grew out of that? Some of the books that I know you've put out, because I have a few uh, in my office, um, have stories of uh, conversion is the word that comes to my mind. Uh, correct me if, if, if you if you if Yes, you will. we have a lot of stories of Jews who have become Catholics. And we don't call that, we would say conversion, you don't call it that as a Jewish and person. Most people say Jews converted and became Catholics. Explain but that. What, what, in all of these books, what each Jew testifies, and this is unanimous, when a Jew becomes a Catholic, they say, I did not change religions, I'm still Jewish. And we've had uh, seminars with Jewish Catholics where we get as many Jewish Catholics together as we can and we all agree, though it's hard to get Jews to agree on anything. They say if you get three Jews together, you get four different opinions, <laughs> which is generally true. But we do get Jewish Catholics to agree that when, we, when a Jew becomes a Catholic, we don't stop being Jewish. In fact, and I say this and others say it, and it's in these books, uh, testimonies like the chief rabbi of Rome during World War II became a Catholic. What's his name? Uh, his name was uh, Eugen Israel Zoli, and when he was baptized, he took the name Eugenio in honor of Pius XII. So, and the story's in the book. Well, we have a whole book. It's called Before the Dawn, which we just reprinted with Ignatius Press. But, um, and I'll just say it in the first person to make it simple. I'm Jewish. I, I found the fullness of Judaism in the Catholic Church, and when I became a Catholic, I did not stop being Jewish. In fact, I am more Jewish now than I was before, and I profess fidelity to the magisterium of the Church and in professing and living my fidelity to the magisterium of the church, I am living my Judaism. And it, in basically that's a paraphrase, pretty much what Cardinal Lustige said. He was the Archbishop of Paris who died recently. But he was a Jewish man born in Paris who uh, became a Catholic just before World War II. He uh, became a priest after World War II. Paul VI made him a bishop. And then um, John Paul II made him Archbishop of Paris and made him a cardinal. And Cardinal Lustige always said that he was Jewish. He was living his Judaism as a Catholic priest. So for the person who is not familiar with any of this, um, that means that you live the fulfillment of the promises made to the people of Israel, exactly. to the Jewish people, that we will have a Messiah. Exactly. You find in Christ the Messiah, which yes. makes you a Christian, a Catholic Christian. A messianic but, Jew, you might correct, say. Correct, but you're not, you don't cease being ethnically, if you will, or belonging to the people of God, the the Well, the, the Jewish, Jewish religion people. is not is not replaced, and that's a, a very serious heresy uh, in, in the church that the church has tried to uh, vigorously to fight against since Vatican II. Does it have a name? That it, it's called um, well, replacement theology. They call it the idea that the church replaces Judaism is false. The church teaches then that the it church is, is fulfilled. Judaism fulfilled. Okay. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, I did not come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. And that's always been the apostolic teaching and that's why we go back to the apostles. That's great. Um, is it um, very, very briefly as we close our time together, uh, Jewish Catholics, Hebrew Catholics interchangeable? Yes, yes. Okay. Some uh, some there are okay. uh, there is a group called Hebrew Catholics and they like to call themselves Hebrew Catholics okay. or Jewish Catholics but we're all Catholics the emphasis really and the primary thing is that we're Catholics and we profess fidelity to the magisterium and we find that Jesus fulfills Judaism and you do what all Catholics do you go to mass you receive the Eucharist you you believe in the Old and the New Testament you venerate both as the Bible you you follow the teachings of the church you're fully Catholic but you're fully Jewish insofar as you've not ceased to be the people elected by God for the coming of the Messiah. Exactly. I would, I would agree with that statement and uh, add that it is it remains, uh, this is a, an awesome part of our faith, it remains a mystery today, mm -hmm. uh, this idea of the, the chosen people of God. Well, I'm sure glad that the Lord chose you from socialist atheism, and I hear you even were a hippie, to becoming a great Catholic evangelist. Thank you so much, well, Mark. Well, thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed these interviews. I hope you have gained some insights as to how you might carry out this beautiful and necessary task that you too may have beautiful feet 
and bring good news. It shouldn't come to us as any surprise that we are called to make converts. Of course, it is the Holy Spirit who is the principal agent of the new evangelization. It is God who indeed makes the converts, but we are his instruments and we are called to do that. It should come as no surprise to us that we are to reach out to everyone, including Jews and Muslims and anyone of any faith or no faith. That is exactly what we see in the New Testament that they did. That is exactly what we've seen throughout the centuries. And I'd like to recommend a couple of resources that might open your understanding even further. This book, A Century of Catholic Converts by Lorene Hanley Duquin, will show stories of people who have come to know Christ in a personal way. There is the series Surprised by Truth by Patrick Madrid, edited by Patrick Madrid, that also has the stories of numerous converts, men and women who have been surprised to find in the Catholic Church the church founded by Jesus Christ, and they wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. May you and I also never trade the faith, the church, for anything in the world. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he smile upon you and be gracious to you. May he show you his countenance and grant you his peace.